Clermont-Ferrand, about 250 miles south of Paris, one of the principal towns in that beautiful area known as the Massif Central. Here in the main square, the inevitable gendarme whistles the traffic on its way past scenes typical of every corner of France. Tall cathedral spires and narrow streets, kindly old folk and busy open-air markets. Of course, there are cafes at every corner, but at Whitson 1959, the Café L'Univers was no ordinary bistro. As headquarters of the Moto Club d'Auvergne, it was the meeting place for every motorcycling enthusiast within miles. On Whit Sunday, the first World Championship meeting of the year would be held over the magnificent new five-mile Circuit de Montagne d'Auvergne, southwest of the town. Let's take a look. Over the starting line, and then the fast left-hand sweep of Pitts Bend leads under the footbridge to the only straight on the circuit, barely half a mile long and uphill at that. Everywhere else, the circuit twists right and left almost continuously. There are no less than 51 corners in its five miles. Here, near the village of Shahad, we are at the highest point, 2,775 feet above sea level. In the next mile and a half, we drop nearly 600 feet to the lowest point. Then begins the long climb up again. But the men to judge this circuit are those who have to race on it. What do they say? How about it, Cyril Smith? Well, I think it's quite a, a reasonable circuit. It's all acceleration and stopping like. Damn hard work, actually. Dickie Dale. Uh, we're on very low gear ratios, which goes to prove that as a circuit, it, it, it isn't a very quick circuit. Gary Hawking. Well, it's uh, pretty good, really. It's just, uh, I think, for a, a five-mile Grand Prix circuit, it should be a little bit faster. A little bit faster? Well, the quicker 500s will be averaging around 75 miles an hour on this. But what does the fastest of them all think? John Surtees. Well, it's quite reasonable. It is a little slippery, but um, on the whole, apart from being very much hard work, it's, it's quite a pleasant circuit. And Florian Cometheus, Swiss sidecar dicer, shall have the last word. Ah, yes, it's very nice circuit. Early on race morning, the police helicopter, known to one and all as Le Chopper, wallows around, netting in with the complex system of round-the-course police radio vans and telephones. Ready are the phones to the marshal's post. Ready the loudspeaker system to all the natural grandstands and vantage points on the slopes around the circuit. Ready the ambulance services. Well, uh, nearly ready. Down in the paddock are the nomads, the continental circus boys who go from meeting to meeting. France one weekend, Germany the next, and then maybe on to Italy. They carry their homes with them, sleeping in caravans or tents, and they're always busy doing something. Even the wives get roped into help. It's getting near race time, and Dickie Dale adds to the din by warming up his big BMW, while some of the others have got some rather more serious tuning to do. Cyril Smith has time for a chat with John Surtees, whilst nearby, Cometheus checks his oil. But there's none of the milling herd for the gleaming MVs, terrific four-cylinder jobs being tended by a gaggle of Italian mechanics in the competitive seclusion of their pits. Standing there on the right, Monsieur Violet, chief steward. There's plenty on his mind today, but he still finds time for a chat with Castro's Albert Divo.
But in the race control office, Australian Bob Brown is probably telling him, not just politely chatting. Earlier on, he had a spot of bother getting his Nortons past the scrutineers. Now come the final preparations for the 350cc race, topping up the tanks and sealing the caps. On Norton number 24 is 21-year-old Southern Rhodesian Gary Hocking, a star in the making who everyone predicts will soon be right at the top. Dickie Dale's 350HAS number 3 is wheeled into the enclosure to join the mass of machines all prepared to the nth degree and ready to blast their way round in the first ever motorcycle race on the Auvergne circuit. Ready on the grid are number 22, John Hempelman of New Zealand, and 30, Bob Brown. England's Dickie Dale and Londoner Jeff Tanner. The well-organized types have pretty girls to look after the details, while if you parlez français, you can even get a gendarme to prop up your bicycle whilst you get your gloves sorted out. Hocking, leathers on now and ready to go. And now, the master himself, John Surtees, the 1958 350 and 500 world champion, about to start another record-breaking season. Surtees is out in front at the start with Hocking and John Harter chasing him and the rest in a close-knit pack behind. About a mile out and it's Surtees, Hartle and Hocking. But by the time they reach the Riso hairpin, nearly four miles out, Hocking, riding like fury, has nosed ahead of Hartle and is almost nudging Surtees. Bob Anderson on 20 is in fourth place, only yards ahead of Hempelman, Brown, Australian Tom Phyllis and South African Paddy Driver. One lap gone and Surtees screams around the pit bend chased by Hocking. Just beyond Sharad, the three leaders go through with very little between them, but it's 11 and a half long seconds before we see Anderson in fourth place. And then almost another five seconds before a matey little bunch consisting of Hempelman, Brown, Phyllis, Driver, Shepherd and Dale come hurtling through. Already the race has settled down to a 1-2-3 pattern that is to remain unchanged, although the gap between Hocking and Hartle is getting much wider. Further back, though, it's nip and tuck all round the course for fifth to eighth places. Bob Brown is riding number 30, Teddy Shepherd number 60, Tom Phyllis is on 18 and Driver on 26. Even further down the field, there is keen dicing, although in a comparatively quiet and gentlemanly fashion, between two Frenchmen, Collet and Ansamini. Gentlemanly, too, is another Frenchman, René Baron, who stops, and for a most unusual reason. He finished last. But thirty is certain that he stopped. The race is at the halfway mark now, and he's about six seconds ahead of Hocking and nine in front of teammate Johnny Hart. The hairpin just before the pits is named in memory of that great French four-wheel driver, Louis Rossier, who was born here in Clermont-Ferrand. Here's Surtees rounding it, and then roaring on up the straight, lapping some of the tail-enders en route. He's followed by Hocking, and right behind him comes Hartle on the second MV. <laughs> 
Bob Anderson is still safely in fourth place, riding a rather lonely race, some way behind Hartle, yet appreciably ahead of the group of happy dices still hotly disputing fifth position. Right now it's number 60, Terry Shepherd, on a Reg Dearden Norton who leads the procession. Just after the start of the 15th lap, Bob Brown snatches the lead of this little group, but not for long. Oil on his right boot causes him to fumble a few gear changes, and he soon finds himself back at number eight on the lap chart, behind driver Shepard and Phyllis. The race is on its last few laps, and Gary Hocking tenaciously holds on to second place, with John Hartle still lying third and unable to narrow the gap between them. Bob Anderson is still fourth and closing up a little on Hartle, but it's too late to affect the final order, for here is Surtees starting off on his last lap. With about a minute in hand over Hocking, the master yowls his MV Augusta for along the straight, with eight championship points as good as chalked up. And it's the checkered flag once again for the brilliant John. He's covered 95 miles at an average of over 73 miles an hour and notched his first big win of the year. Now there's peace and quiet for a few minutes and time for the gendarmes to go about their normal business of arresting the local citizens. But it isn't long before the 24 sidecar outfits trundle up to the grid. Amongst them, last year's world champion, Walter Schneider of Germany, and Fritz Scheidegger of Switzerland. Another Swiss, Edgar Strube, and another, Florian Cometius. Australian, Lindsay Urquhart. Helmut Fatt from Germany. And Cyril Smith. An impressive lineup. Almost as impressive as that one. Schneider on his white BMW outfit who leads at the start and along the straight he seems to be pulling away fractionally as they accelerate through the gears. But beyond Charade, both Cometheus number 7 and Scheidegger on number 11 have nipped past him and by the end of lap 1 Cometheus is leading comfortably. Here is Scheidegger. Schneider on number 1 and Cyril Smith on 21 in fourth place. Round the bend and full bore up the straight with the order unchanged. By now, Cometheus has a six second lead over Scheidegger, but this is not to be the leader's lucky day. Seized gearbox slides him onto the grass. No damage done, but his day's racing has come to an abrupt end and Scheidegger is left with a clear road ahead. Smith is now lying third, but an oil pipe is adrift, and at the end of the third lap, he has to pull into the pits and retire from the race, which brings the bright yellow BMW of Edgar Strube, number 45, up into third position.
In fourth position comes number 39, Germany's Helmut Fatt. Heidegger is right on form today, and although it's the world champion who is chasing him, he even manages to increase his lead. Here comes Schneider, number one, snarling in pursuit, and you can see that his sidecar is mounted on the right, whereas Scheidegger has his hitched on the left. Compare the styles, which makes for the faster cornering, driving round the chair or hauling the chair round the machine. Eric Oliver, four times world champion, says he prefers driving round the sidecar. So, on this clockwise course, Schneider should have the edge on the corners. But does he? What do you think? settling down to something of a procession, the spectators turn their attention further down the field to number 23, Ragliardo, who has been dicing like a demon with fellow countryman Jacques Duhem riding number 27. Also in the battle were two Germans, Ritter and Neusner, on numbers 31 and 37. amongst the leaders again and Edgar Strube is still hanging on to third place with his BMW, like all the others in the race, going like oiled silk. Even so, he is running nearly four minutes behind Scheidegger, who seems a safe bet for a win now that the race has only a few more laps to go. Try as he may, Schneider can do nothing about reducing that lead of Scheidegger's. And after 13 laps, 65 miles, at an average of over 64 miles an hour, Scheidegger gets the flag and coasts in to collect eight championship points. Schneider comes in to second place, and he has to be content with six points and a bottle of strong orange aid thrown in as a consolation prize. Strube rolls home into third place, and then it's the moment for national anthems and flag flying, kisses and bouquets, handshakes and cheering. And if you think there seem to be an awful lot of people up there, remember sidecars carry passengers. Lunchtime, simple for some, rather more opulent for others. And then over to the pits once again, in time to see the machines being wheeled out for the big race of the day, for 500s over 25 laps. If there was any betting, there would be quite a lot of francs staked on Surtees and the MV4. The second MV is being ridden by Remo Venturi. Ralph Renson on his Norton, and another Norton exponent, his has a two-plug head, Paddy Driver from South Africa. Bob Anderson wondering whether he can match his placing in the 350 race, and Terry Shepard, who doesn't look as though he has any worries. Ready to go again, and nearest the camera and the best position for Pitts Bend is John Surtees. But this time, three others beat him to it. Hocking is first round the corner and thunders ahead up the straight. A quarter of the way round and Hocking still leads, but the Italian Venturi is second, with Surtees pretty well breathing his exhaust.
As they come down the hill towards the Riso hairpin, Surtees appears where we all expected him to be. Out in front, having gobbled up Venturi and Hocking in about half a lap. There goes the maestro, increasing his lead fractionally all the time. And at the Louis Rosier hairpin, he's about to finish a standing start lap of over 70 miles an hour. But Hocking and Venturi are right there, and only split seconds separate the three as they belt up the straight and get ready to cope with the series of downhill curves and corners that follow. Now Bob Anderson, number 20, comes into the picture as a brilliant fourth, closing up fast on Venturi. By the end of the third lap, he's made third place and leads Venturi by two and a half seconds. He holds it for a further two laps, and then, when we hear he has temporarily run out of road, he drops five places before getting mobile again. That brings number five, Venturi, back into third spot and lets Dickie Dale on his factory BMW number three and driver on the Norton number 26 into fourth and fifth positions. Most of the time, these two are riding almost neck and neck, swapping places nearly every lap. Quite a sad day for Johnny Hartle. He's had to stand down so that Venturi could have a ride. And all he can do is to watch Surtees instead of having a crack at catching him. second place, Hocking is still riding beautifully, but he's got precious little in hand over Venturi on that second string MV. Too little, in fact, for just before the end of the 14th lap, the Italian manages to squeeze past, and that means there are two MVs screaming along in the first two places. By now, the Dale driver scrap has sorted itself out, with Dale in fourth place about 20 seconds ahead. But driver isn't exactly hanging about, is he? Even so, he eventually finds himself beaten down to sixth place by Shepard on number 60, who has been passing the time, having a magnificent dice with Tom Phyllis on 18 and Bob Anderson, a game which went on for lap after lap. Two more laps, ten miles to go. Venturi is a safe second, and Hocking, although he has dropped back noticeably, is an equally safe third. And that's the last pit signal John Surtees will get. He's on his last lap now, with everything neatly buttoned up, and his MV screaming as melodiously as at the start. Master has done it again. Two wins in one day. And that makes everyone on the circuit happy. The day's racing is over, and John Surtees is the hero with a double in the first classic meeting of the year. He's right in the groove again, with eight points in each of the major world's championship classes, and nobody showing any real signs of seriously disputing his lead in the Grand Prix races during the following months. Yes, the Union flag, in honor of John, 
is going to flutter from masts in a good many other countries before the racing season is through. The loudspeakers are dead. Racing machinery is loaded into vans, gear is packed, tents are struck. The nomads of the Continental Circus take to the roads once more and Clermont-Ferrand returns to normal.